He's one of the first people that I ever worked with in the Liberty Movement, uh, so he took a huge gamble <laughs> on having me come on his show, uh, The No State Project. You can check him out at markstevens.net. He is the author of Adventures in Legal Land, a must-have manual for anybody who's even close to the grim, blood-soaked leviathan of state power in the form of the, quote, justice system, and there's a, uh, a misnomer if ever there was one. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mark Stevens! Wow. Well, thank you, Steph. I want to thank uh, Joyce and uh, Sky, wherever you happen to be, for the opportunity to be here again at Libertopia. So I was here last, well, we were in Los Angeles last year, and they invited me back. So I think, I uh, oh, appreciate that. And I also got to thank Bows and Arrows. I know they, they left to go get something to eat, but uh, that, wow, that was, that was really something. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, again, my, Mark Stevens, I, I'm pretty much, uh, I do a radio show called The No State Project. Uh, we're actually doing it live right now. I, did the first hour myself, and uh, Lark and Rose and Bill Bupert are now manning the uh, the microphones now, and uh, I'll finish the uh, second hour. Well, we're live from 1 to 4 p.m. every every Saturday on LRN.FM, so you can get a bumper sticker and some shirts over there. Um, and what we talk about on the No State Project is bringing about a voluntary society. In fact, uh, we've got some shirts available still that, that, that have that on there. Um, the idea of the show is to be activist driven, it's to actually do something. So what we don't talk about on the show, we don't really talk about just why we need a voluntary society, we talk about actually getting to the voluntary society. And as Steph pointed out, uh, in my book Adventures in Legal Land, I do talk a lot about uh, dealing with bureaucrats, dealing with the IRS, and, and uh, that's what we do on the show. So. People call into the show, we talk, you know, they have problems with traffic tickets or property taxes, taxes, things like this. We help, we help get, them, uh, get them resolved. So the, the, what I'm talking about today is effective damage control. Because like I wrote in the book, if a bureaucrat sends you a letter, it's usually not to say hello. He wants something. He wants your time. He wants your property. He's going to damage you. You can't win against bureaucrats. Once they put their sights on you, you get the ticket, you get the letter in the mail, I've got a nice one here we'll talk about. Once you get that, you have already lost. Because you're not going to be doing anything productive with your time. There is no magic bullet. There is no magic method. There is no method that will win every time. There is no winning. That's not to say that you can't get a ticket thrown out. Because we get them thrown out all the time. Uh, we just last night, I, was, I did the Truth Frequency show with Chris Gio and Cherie. And we were talking about he had gotten arrested by DHS, Department of Homeland Security. And he was arrested, and he was given, you know, they filed a criminal complaint against him, and I helped him with the paperwork. And not only was it dismissed this week, it was expunged. Is that the right word? I think it's gone. So what he told me yesterday, there's no record at the court that there was a complaint filed against him, which is pretty nice. But even though it got thrown out, I don't like to characterize it as winning because, well, it's a whole Charlie Sheen reference. You know, winning, it just, it, okay. <laughs> Not a lot of Charlie, fan, Charlie Sheen fans here. But um, I don't like to characterize it as winning because it did take his time. He had to get with me. He had to talk with me and, and, you know, and discuss how he was going to do it. The paperwork had to be done. He had to spend his time going down to the court and filing it. So it took his time and nothing really productive was done. Although, because he does a radio show, it provides a nice material for the show, and, uh, and then also for my show. So I, I want to make that clear. We're talking about damage control. And a good example of damage control would be, um, recently, somebody was looking at a $400 traffic ticket in, in California. And he filed some paperwork that he had gotten from me. And the prosecutor went and made a deal. He said, basically, instead of going through the demur issue, it's a motion to dismiss uh, the complaint for failure to state a claim, things like this. Instead of, uh, instead of going to the prosecutor, he said, well, instead of the $400, uh, why, why do you say 75 bucks? And uh, everyone goes home happy, right? So we took the deal. That's effective damage control. He went from $400 to the 75. It may have, it, it, the time of trial could have cost him more than 75 bucks worth of his time. So that's what I mean by damage control. And, and again, a lot of tickets are thrown out. A lot of assessments from the IRS are thrown out or they leave you alone. And uh, they, don't, they wind up not paying anything other than the time that they had to invest in that. Okay? So I want to make clear what we mean by the damage control. Now, 
tickets with the IRS and things like this. This is one of the things that I, or assessments, this is what I, I spend most of my time doing. In fact, before I drove out here to, uh, Thursday morning, I had to speak to a DOJ attorney named Rick Watson. And he started off very happy. <laughs> they always tend to. But the way I do things is just to ask some questions. And I'll just give you a, a quick story and then break down exactly why uh, it's been so effective over the years. So they filed a civil action in the Denver, I think it was the Denver District Court, to get a judgment for taxes that they could then foreclose on and take a house or whatever they want to take from the guy. So we get him on the phone and I said, look, I think, you know, we just have a couple of questions. Maybe we can resolve this without, uh, you know, a trial, going to court or anything like that. I said, oh, well, what, what, what do you got for me? What's the question? I said, well, did you do any investigation at all into uh, the agents who did the assessments? I mean, have you spoken with them? Have any contacts? No. No. What's your point? That is my point. Now we you start to think about this. Well, what are, you, what are you getting at? I said, well, I'm asking if you did any investigation to see if the assessment, you know, if the agents, you know, about the agents who had done the assessments. He says, well, no, but what's your point? They're presumptively correct. I said, that is my point. Now he's getting very upset. I don't feel I have to, let, you know, spell things out for, for a lawyer. See, if you go into federal rules of civil procedure, rule 11, for you, me, and, and everybody else, except for the lawyers, you have to do a reasonable inquiry. When you sign the document, you're cert certifying you did a reasonable inquiry into the truth and accuracy of the claims that were made in the complaint or whatever pleading you did. So now I have an admission from a DOJ attorney. He did no investigation whatsoever before he filed his complaint. Nice one, Rick. So he's a little upset now, but I still have another question I'm going to try to get in. This is where he loses it. I said, Ray, I, just another quick question. You filed a civil action against my client. He says, yes, that's right, it's civil. Is it in the nature of a, you know, I said, well, look, we could avoid filing a whole motion for a more definite statement. It just, can you tell me on the phone now, is it in the nature of a contract dispute or a tort? He comes unglued. I mean, he is living. He, this is the exact quote. I am not going to waste my time with this tax protesting crap. So I said, that's quite a leap you're making there, sir. I mean, I'm asking about a contract or a tour, and you're talking about tax protesting crap. And so he yells at me again, and I said, well, sir, just, just relax. You are an adult. Just calm down. I'm asking a question. No, you're not. <laughs> well, as we go through, and I say on the show, you are dealing with a five-year-old in an adult body because he has the emotional coping skills of a five-year-old, which is why we don't mouth off to police officers on a traffic stop. You can always fix it in court. Um, so one of the things that I do is it, we, when we talk about court, because it's so easy to have a police officer declared incompetent to testify against you, it doesn't make any sense to risk your life on the street. I'm not in this to be a martyr on the side of the street. <laughs> That's not what we're here. Uh, we, I do what I do. I believe that we all do this because we love life. We love, and, and life, liberty is just an extension of our lives. It's how we live our lives. I don't think it's, it's necessary to try to get shot or tased or, uh, you know, on the side of the street. So we just, yes, sir, no, sir, we fix it later. It's a fairly easy thing to do. But you are dealing with a five-year-old with a gun. I mean, anyone who's ever had kids, a five-year-old doesn't get what he wants, what does he start to do? Well, what does a judge do when you ask him certain questions? Uh, we know. With it. In fact, I actually, we're not going to play it yet, but we'll get to that. We actually, I have, a, I have a, uh, some audio of a judge. <laughs> In, uh, in Keene, New Hampshire, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But a lot of what I do, and why I think it's effective damage control, why so many tickets have been thrown out, uh, where 75% of the time that, so if you file the, the paperwork that I have, not that it's magic, but 75% of the time the cop doesn't show up. We just do something a little different than a lawyer or most people do. I always provide a copy of the paperwork to the cop at the police department so he knows what I'm going to question him on. Because who wrote the ticket? It's usually not a prosecutor or a lawyer, it's the cop. So I always send him a copy. So what I like to do is I like to strip through all the fictions. If you take a situation with a police officer in court or you're in court or, or you've got a situation where you're dealing with the IRS, you want to take and look at things and separate the fact from the fiction. Well, what When the IRS comes after you, other than your, your mailing address and your name, and no, I'm not going to get into this whole name business. 
But be, beyond your name, your address, the year, and how, much, uh, how many Federal Reserve notes you may have gotten for a particular year, all of the rest of that is fiction. Taxpayer, taxable income, obligated to file, required to file a return, all of those are fictions. So if you separate that and you focus just on the facts, this has been a very successful method for damage control. Now, all of us take fictions into, or, you know, that's how we function. Some have more fictions than others. Of course, out here in California, hoy. But we all have these fictions. And what's important is to meet people at their map of the world. So our fictions make up our generalizations and our maps of the world. We all have them. And so I got into, uh, not a confrontation, but a disagreement last week where somebody was mentioning something about these belief systems. Is it, like, look, we all have our own way of looking at the world. And, and this is the, the main reason why we should have a voluntary society. Because you should can have whatever reality you want, that's the way we're hardwired, that's, you know, we all see things different based on our backgrounds and our experiences. The problem comes in when someone grabs a machine gun and wants you to join their delusion or their map of the world. So what I suggest doing for effective damage control is meeting the agent at, at his map of the world. You have to have some overlap between your view of the world and his. Because if you don't, you can't have a rational discourse. You can't have a rational discussion. You're, you're one speaking one language, one is speaking another. An example is uh, Suzanne Small, who is a franchise tax board attorney. So hopefully nobody here has had, had to have any interaction with her. So I'm asking her about the facts the assessment's based on. She keeps telling me about the law. And she breaks down and she says, I'm having an extremely difficult time communicating with you, Mark. I, I, I can't follow this. It's because I'm asking you about the facts, you keep going back to the law. You have to be responsive to what I'm asking you. And the problem is, in their map of the world, they only deal with abstractions. And when you're with an attorney, attorneys are taught principles. These are abstractions. They learn abstract thought, and they start to link together one abstraction with another with another. And that's why most people, when they start hearing lawyers talk, they completely zone out and your, our eyes glaze over, because you're not talking about anything concrete. It's also why you will have conflicting decisions if you go into court cases. They will actually uh, contradict themselves in the same opinion. So you can go to my website at markstevens.net and I have examples of that. The same opinion. So it's not that a later court, a later Supreme Court is disagreeing with an earlier one. You've got the same group of lawyers who are writing this trying to validate their position, their spin, and so they have to do things like that. So one of the things that I realized by taking things more factually and what I can prove, what can I prove empirically? What I found out is the opinion when it comes to bureaucrats is backwards from what normal people do. A, lawyers form an opinion first. Then all the facts have to conform to that opinion. And because of that, you get ridiculous responses from attorneys. That's why I can ask John Webb, when you say state of New Hampshire, what do you mean? Is it, a, is it a pseudonym or is it concrete? What is it? And he goes, I don't think it would be terribly productive uh, um, uh, yeah, to debate uh, esoterics. The only way to account for such a stupid remark from somebody with a Juris Doctorate degree is that he only deals in fictions, the fiction comes first, the facts must conform to that, instead of like a normal person, you look at the facts and you draw your opinion from that. The problem is when you're getting into the area of taxation, they are so conditioned, and most people are, they can't see it's a fiction. So let me give you an example. If I say, Steve, I'm going to kill you, you son of a... And I pick up a chair and I break it over your back. Those are the facts. The lawyers will say, that's assault and battery. Now, if I don't give you, I'm going to kill you in, in, in the chair, and I just say, you're guilty of assault and battery. You committed assault and battery. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? No. But there it's easy. You have absolutely no context. All you have 
is an opinion. You have no facts that the opinion is conforming to, so it doesn't tell you anything. Well, the same thing applies in the tax realm or when you're dealing with a traffic ticket. When they say you are a taxpayer, it is an opinion. It gives you absolutely no context whatsoever on the underlying facts it's supposed to be based on. They believe the opinion is paramount. It's just an opinion. If you ask them, they will, if, you, you, if you research some of their laws, one of the things that I ask them is, are your opinions irrefutable? That I'm, are your opinions that I'm a taxpayer and have taxable income, are they irrefutable? Now when they understand what it means, it really puts them in a bind. Because they don't want to admit that they're wrong, or that they could be wrong. They don't like to do that. I got the IRS to admit a position that I had that, uh, where I challenged witnesses and evidence. They always say it's frivolous. They just reflexively say it's frivolous. I got them to admit it's not. Because they said I based it on a frivolous argument. Well, Steve, you know me well enough. I always ask, well, if it's a frivolous argument, can you cite it for me? Where in my paperwork is this, just quote it, quote it to me. I want to know. Well, after three months, they finally said, well, you're, you're right, it's not frivolous. But they won't put it in writing. So I'm talking to them about it. I said, I said whoa, whoa. Finally. Yes. Not frivolous. You have no idea how much time this is going to save people. I need that in writing. No. She said, absolutely not. Because I work with a lot of people out here in California with the Franchise Tax Board, and they know if I have that my position is not frivolous, they can't send you to the frivolous filing, the frivolous non-filer department, whose official, official position, if they consider it frivolous, is to not respond to you any further. That is their official position. So I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I've been out this too long. I need this in writing. And then she, are you recording this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I already got you on record, and I've already told your legal department that I record all the calls. Not only that, I'm in Arizona, and I don't really have to tell you, but I did. <laughs> They don't like that because what they'll do to you is they will lie to you and they will say, you can't record it, and you'll say, well, but you're recording it. No, we're not. So I had to get their legal department to agree that they did record it when they didn't want to do that. So the way I did that, being a schmuck from Long Island that I am, I decided to say, you know what, uh, man to man, I think we both know that you're lying. And the way to prove that is, if I was to make a... Now remember, I'm talking to a lawyer with the Franchise Tax Board in Sacramento. If I was to make a hypothetical threat, you're telling me there's no recording of that? Really? He broke down. Yeah. All right, when you put it in that context, you're right. What other context? What are you talking about here? When in that context, what he means is, you caught me, I'm lying through my teeth, you got me. And I don't want to do like these agents who have such a bad reputation and just hang up the phone. You got me. Will he put it in writing? No, no. But I got it recorded, so that's good enough. So they don't want to give this to me in writing. So what they did was they, uh, they had the initial decision where it said uh, it's denied because it was based on a frivolous argument. And so all they did was restate it and they struck out the part that said frivolous argument. So I said, why did you deny it then? Well, we did. <laughs> we got that, I, got, yeah, I can read, I'm literate. Why? Why did you deny this? We did. So because they can't say it's frivolous, which is their reflexive response to everything, they're stuck. They don't have a reason why. There's no reason why they're denying it. And never, there's no, if you don't like it, why don't you just appeal it? Well, it's easy for you to say that because it's my client's money. See, I'm not like a lawyer. The client spending the money is actually important to me. And so I try to minimize the time that I'm spending on this. So it's the client that has to be further hurt by this. So I'm not really in a position to want to have it to go any further because my job, when somebody works with me, is to have the IRS leave you alone as quickly as possible not to have to keep going on and on and on because the agents don't care and they know that the judges just rubber stamp.
and we can prove that. I'll give you a little bit of a, a little, little context here. IRS situation, you go to the website, you can hear, I'm speaking to the attorney for the IRS. She's done no investigation whatsoever into the assessments. She had no contact with my client whatsoever, insisting he's a taxpayer with taxable income. Has never spoken to the agent. Doesn't even know his name. Now, the analogy that I use that they don't like because it, it makes sense, it shows how stupid, you know, how silly their position is. They like to tell you that the agent who says you are a taxpayer and have taxable income, that accusation against you, and it is an accusation, so if you're dealing with the IRS, call it what it is. When they say you're a tax taxpayer with taxable income, it's an accusation no different than calling you a thief. Okay? It's a legal opinion and it has to have some factual support. Okay? We went into, we were in pre-trial discovery by the way, so for those who aren't aware, when you're in pre-trial discovery, that's what you do. You say who you rely on as a witness, what they're going to testify. We can't get the name of the agent. Michael Thornton, a former treasury attorney, now turned tax court judge, refused to allow the disclosure of the agent's name because he did not believe it could lead to discoverable material or advance the case. So the analogy I use so they understand why it's so important is, look at the assessment like a traffic ticket and the tax agent is the cop. What happens if the cop doesn't show up, which he does in 75% of the time with me? They have to throw it out. And Norm here, we did this just recently, he confronted the judge initially, I was on the phone with him, it was a, telephon a telephonic hearing in a traffic Okay, so it's fun. The judge denies the motion saying that there is a valid cause of action, which we've got him on record now. There has to be a legal injury to have a cause of action. We'll get to this. So I'm helping Norm, and he can, three times he says to the judge, since you insist there's a valid cause of action here, how many elements are in a valid cause of action, and where are they in this complaint? So what does he do instead of Instead of just saying, uh, 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 he accuses Norm of not wanting to participate. So that's something you have to remember when you're doing damage control. It's all about the misdirection. Lawyers are always constantly just dis distracting you from the facts. It's always distraction, 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 distraction. It violates the Fourth Amendment. Distraction. Whether it's true or not, it's distracting from the facts. What's important is you don't take machine guns and barge into someone's home because they have a plan. That's the way I take it. I don't care about the Fourth Amendment. Does, it, that, it, what's important is you don't use physical violence against somebody because they have a plan. Where is the legal injury? So what they did with Norm, out of frustration, he says, you don't want to proceed. That's, you're not real. We're going to have to reset this. But I caution you, sir, you may not be able to do this on the phone again. <laughs> Fine, okay. So, when you did it again, mysteriously, the cop didn't show up. So the judge begrudgingly dismissed. So I did a follow-up. Because I want to know why the cop isn't showing up. I don't want to be like the IRS or these lawyers and talk about abstractions. I want evidence. So I contacted the Sheriff's Department. I know the cop didn't show up. Was he on the docket for any other tickets that day? Why didn't he show up here? They won't respond. That's why Taryn is asking you, asking me, how did you? <laughs> you listen to enough of my, my phone calls, but they're always hanging up on me. <laughs> it's just a common thing. But I tell people this is fine because it only lasted a few minutes. It's less money, right? It's damage control. You don't need to be on the phone with them that long because most of the time, if you hear, and I urge you, please not just take my word for it. I could be a pathological liar. Hell, I probably am. But I have on the website objective recordings where I'm in a hearing with a, um, a tax agent and, they, and we got them under oath. I have the entire thing online and you can hear the entire, it, 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 and, and it, it's, it's great. And we get into some of the issues that I'm going to talk about here. Remember, this is damage control. 
You want it over fairly quickly, so I know that you're going to say, Mark, this took an hour. <laughs> what, what's this? But they left the guy alone. But the damage control and looking at things more as they are, you're able to ask very, very effective questions and put them in a double bind, where they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. So what we go through here, where they give you this impression that when you go to court or you're dealing with the IRS, that they're going to be fair, right? They're going to be fair. You can ask them. Well, if you look at things as more as they really are, you're in a situation where you're forced to be there and has nothing to do with your consent. You got a guy with a robe on, you got a prosecutor, and, and then there's you. Nothing involves your consent. These are just men forcing you to do something. But they're pretending to be administering justice. Well, these are people with absolutely no voluntary support whatsoever. Right? All taxation is compulsory, so government has no voluntary support. It's a really great question to ask a uh, congressman or someone to say, Given the fact that all taxation is compulsory, do you have any evidence, do you have any voluntary support whatsoever? Now they're stumped. The only thing, well, who's going to build the roads? People. Neck it. You know, that's why yesterday voluntarism is the easiest thing in the world to, to, to convert people to. They already are. So an example of this, in looking at the situation where they're just people and not accepting this ridiculous myth that they're honorable, okay, you can ask some very effective questions. They will actually dig the hole for themselves because they have to maintain a presumption of legitimacy. See, if we're in court, you guys are sitting here, if you're not buying with me, as, if I'm the judge, if you're not buying this crap, you're not going to pay me. So I got to do a good job making this look good, which I'm, I think I'm not doing a good job now. <laughs> I'm failing now. So one of the things that we do when we go in there is to not be confrontational. A lot of the damage control is to get the idea out of our heads and out of our hearts, especially, that we're not here to fight. I call it in the book Zen and the Auto Litigation because you do not want to be a combatant. If you're argumentative, if you're disagreeing with them, they're just going to disagree with you and you've committed the cardinal due process sin. You've allowed them to be responsive. Being responsive is their only real obligation there for due process. Don't let them be responsive. So what I present, especially in a new book with an explicit model of this, what I present is, a, is an easy to learn model based on looking things more as they are. Because I'm sure if you saw a judge walking around here with a robe on and he started screaming contempt, we'd all start laughing at him. All right? There was somebody the other day doing that, it was hilarious. Uh, uh, so when we go into court, and you can hear this for when I did it with the tax hearing. So I have a contemporary example, a real life thing, and you can hear how it really, really binds them up. And I don't have to quote the law. I don't even have to know the law, because I don't. <laughs> okay, uh, I can't stand up here and quote statutes. I, it's not my thing. But you don't need to. And this is why what, what I do is teach people to be their own attorney. So they don't have to use lawyers. They don't have to spend 250 to $500 an hour for someone to talk abstractions. And okay, and just make a deal. So what we do is we got the situation. We're not making any. And Gina, just let me know when I got five minutes left. So what we do when we go in is ask the judge if we're entitled to a fair hearing, and he's got to say, "Well, yeah, of course. We're Americans. We're fair. Great. Can I get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interests? Well, no, of course not." Nice. This is a bad, pot, bad spot to be in if you're a judge. So now I ask the judge, because we are, you know, through investigation, which I have a lot more on the website and the archives of the radio show, I'm going to, knowing what we already know, that's all a fiction and how things work and what they're doing with these words, because it's, it's all a word game, because I just have, I saw, let me just summarize, so you can follow. Am I entitled to a fair hearing or a fair trial? Yes. Can I get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interest? No. And then I say to him, sir, who do you represent here? Now, most of the time, they're smart enough not to answer this question. Occasionally, we get guys where it's going quick, and they stumble on him. So this happened in Keene. You can go to freekeene.com, and you can see John Arnold saying, State of New Hampshire. Now, you want to be real 
professional about this and play the babe in the woods. You gotta play stupid. You gotta be like them. Sir, I'm not an attorney. I, I don't understand here. If you represent the state of New Hampshire, you represent the plaintiff? Wouldn't that be a conflict of interest? Again, I'm not accusing him of having a conflict of interest. I'm just asking a question. It's so like I, someone mentioned earlier, what I used to say all the time is, you're playing Columbo. So it could be one of these things, and can I get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interest? No. Okay. Just, just one more thing, sir. <laughs> Who do you represent here? And so, this is obvious. He's already told me I can't get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interest. He's telling me he represents a party. He's saying it, not me. He's a judge. So like I say at workshops, I'm just a schmuck from Long Island. Who cares about what I have to say about the law? The judge with the robe on is the acknowledged legal expert. He's the one saying he represents the state of New Hampshire. And you, again, you can go online, you can see this, and I have where judges have said that too. So what do you think they do from this point? Is he calm and rational anymore? Five-year-old with a gun, right? He's screaming. So another eyes, rational, professional man who's asked who he represents is now in a fit of rage. Why? Because you're coming in and non-violently, non-contradictory, you're not fighting him. All you're doing is you're pointing out his many contradictions. And that's not to say we don't all carry contradictions, but we're not using guns to enforce them. He is. He doesn't deserve... He doesn't deserve any... Uh, <laughs> what's the word? Yeah, soft pedaling. This is a very volatile situation here. So a lot of times, we're not worried that they just throw it out. And people will say, ah, that had nothing to do with the merit that Mark presented. He had no merit to it whatsoever. I don't care. I don't care if anyone, you know, who's a critic thinks there's merit to it or not. You can, it, it speaks for itself. It's not about me. You know, so if you listen, or you see some of the trolls, it's always, it's the way it is with liberty. They, they attack the person. So I might be an idiot. Ah, well, but what about the information? So what I talk about a lot is about a cause of action and that there has to be a legal injury. And they always come back and say, that's frivolous, that doesn't, or it doesn't apply here. It's a new legal standard, by the way. It doesn't apply here. Feel free to use that. That's, uh... <laughs> so... Well, <laughs> we get that all the time. So when they say, that, that doesn't apply here. Uh, really? Is, do, do, can you cite that? Is there any basis to that? No, you, it just doesn't apply. Great, can I adopt that same legal standard there, tough guy? Okay, oh, a traffic ticket doesn't apply to me. Oh, a basis? Grounds? No, don't need it in this court. Apparently here you don't need that. So I've spoken about this a bit, and I think it's a very important issue. Um, I did a habeas corpus for Ian Freeman, who's a friend of mine who was put in prison, or put in jail, up in Keene, New Hampshire, for standing in front of a car, for 45 seconds. So call it obstruction, say he's guilty of sin. Fine. He's given a year in jail. And they suspended all but 90, and he did 60 days. So I filed the habeas corpus. In their zeal to not hear from me, which I can understand is a common feeling here today. <laughs> but in their zeal to not hear from me, because I'm not a lawyer, and I... I'm not a lawyer. Don't claim to be, don't want to be, don't, not a lawyer. Uh, so to convince the judge not to listen to me and not let me say anything, because when we were in court, I confronted him. I need a point of clarification. So what we're going to do is we're going to play that clip now. This is, from the, this is from the Keene Superior Court. This is an illegal recording according to Philip Manjon and uh, Tom Arnold and these other guys. So this, this is an illegal recording of the... Uh, habeas corpus hearing. It's only about a minute long. All right. If uh, the parties, uh, counsel, etc., can uh, identify themselves for the record, please. Good morning, Your Honor. John Webb, appearing for the respondent. My name is David Crocker. David who? Crocker. Okay. And uh, you're in from uh, from King. Yes, I am. All right. And I believe by telephone we have uh, Mark Stevens from Arizona. Yes, good morning, Mark Stevens, and uh, I want to, if I can get a clarification from Mr. Webb, uh, as far as who he's appearing on behalf of. 
Excuse me, he's here on behalf of the uh, county uh, department of corrections. Just one minute. When I'm reading his paperwork, it says that uh, he's written here. Now comes the state of New Hampshire buying through the office of the Cheshire County Attorney. Is he appearing on behalf of the state of New Hampshire? Mr. Webb. Thank you, Your Honor. As I said, I'm appearing on behalf of the respondent. Is I am. Okay, just to a point of clarification, because this is an important issue, uh, when he says he's appearing on behalf of the state of New Hampshire, is he talking about the body politic? All right, let's not start with that, sir. His appearance has been filed as counsel for Rick Van Wickler. Wickler, we will proceed. If you do not feel I'm handling this matter appropriately, you may appeal. Well, All right. Thank you. Sir? Sir? Do not start with me. Just do not start with me. All right, if uh, the parties, uh, counsel, et cetera, can uh, identify themselves for the record. Well, right. thank you. Sir? Sir? Do not start with me. Just do not start with me. Now, some people may say, why are you making such a big deal about this? Now, this is a man who's a friend of mine, but he, you know, he, he, uh, he hosts Free Talk Live. He's a real guy. Just like us. He spent 60 days in jail. To have a legitimate, valid, or legal, constitutional, whatever conviction against him, they had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt his presence within the state of New Hampshire. Does this sound like a pretty important thing to you? Yeah. And you notice how they don't want to challenge, I can't challenge him. But what I don't have here in the clip, because it would bore you to tears, is the rest of the hearing consisted of him challenging me. Nice. So, say Mark can't do this, great. Why, sir, don't... <laughs> do not start with me. So, I want to finish here. So, in their zeal, they will always give you something to use against them. So, for example, when we have a witness declared incompetent by asking two questions, did you file a valid cause of action against me? Yes, I did. Uh, okay, officer, uh, how many elements in a valid cause of action? Objection! Calls for legal conclusion. The witness is incompetent to testify. Great. Strike his testimony and the ticket. Thank you. So what they do is they turn around and... <sighs> Denied. So what you do is you don't fight. You turn around and you pick somebody. You, my Dago friend, you. Come up here and testify on my behalf. Because what happens is the judge freaks out and the prosecutor loses their mind. He can't testify. He's not qualified. Apparently that's not a, a requirement of this court. Because you just let the cop do it. So, effective damage control is using what they have spewed forth, the nonsense that they have vomited out of their mouth. Because they put the opinion before the facts, you can always turn it around on them. And that's what we've got here. I can't tell you, I'm almost as excited for this as playing in with the band. Anyone who's familiar with me knows that I talk about there has to be legal injury because the PR is the government was created to protect and maintain the individual right. So you, that's the basis of the jurisdiction of the court. Well, Mr. John Webb, after thinking it was frivolous, I will read it verbatim, it will be on the website. First, Mr. Stevens lacks standing to file a motion in this matter. He has suffered no legal injury. And he was nice enough to do the research for me and support it with a New Hampshire Supreme Court case. So what I'm encouraging people in Keene, New Hampshire to do, especially if Mr. Webb is your prosecutor, to file this with your motion to dismiss as an exhibit and use his own stupid motion <laughs> against him. But that is effective damage control. When we're living a life of freedom and liberty and we're living more free, that's going to anger some people. And eventually there's always a risk involved. So what I try to do is minimize that risk so that we can all participate and do something to help bring about a voluntary society. So part of this comes in where I have my, my uh, parking ticket traffic study. Where if you want to participate, you purposely get a parking ticket, and we will track the results. 
and we've got participants, many in California already, so don't, if you're in California, maybe not. But we've got participants all over the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and England. So we're really looking forward to this. But it's about damage control, limiting the amount of damage. We want to live free. We don't want to ask for, for permission, but we're going to invite trouble because they really tend to hate that. Uh, and so I appreciate the opportunity to come out here and talk today. Again, my name is Mark Stevens. It's markstevens.net. Do we have any questions? Are we doing that? Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, isn't that, you said don't be combative because it just won't get you. Don't be what? Combative. Right. right. So is there a reason for the part to make He's asking about the purpose of the traffic study. There's a number of reasons for the traffic study. I, I, doing the radio show every week, I was noticing where people were responding to certain activist type of things. Because the show is about doing something. It's about living free. Okay, and I want to be able to do something and every week be able to say, I did something to help bring about a little bit more freedom in, in the world. The, uh, the problem is, like when you see what they're doing up in Keene, there's a lot of violent confrontations where people go to jail. And people don't want to risk that, but they still want to be actively involved in doing something. So the parking study, part of it is to minimize the risk. I don't want you getting a ticket for no driver's license or something like that because you, you can have a violent confrontation with the police officer on the street. I don't want that. I want you to be able to get a parking ticket so you can raise the same issues and challenge the people who call themselves government and be able to do it with minimal risk to you. And so all the issues, like, look, it, I am able to go into court and challenge these fictions and put them on the spot and bring that out. Another important part is, and I know my wife is here, she's probably going to say, yeah, see, I told you, it's an anger thing. <laughs> One of the things I want to be able to show, because I've had a number of police officers quit, I've had about four or five cops that I knew quit after hearing a lot of the information, which is great. What I want to be able to do is to take these judges who think that they are in control and yes dear I want to knock them down a, bit, a peg what I am what I when I talk about impeaching the witness this is something we do all the time because I can accurately predict how the cop or the judge is going to respond because they're so extremely rigid in their behavior I'm right you're wrong that's the way it is and so I take advantage of that I use that and embrace their rigidity and you can use that because I can predict the outcome. So I know, and in advance, when you read the traffic study article, we're going to let them know, and it, you know, after it happens, you, sir, were not the one in control here. You have your guns, you've got your automatons that are willing to carry out your order, but you damn well were not the one in charge. We manipulated you from 12,000 miles away to not only say that it's okay to take, the, to take the testimony of a witness you said was incompetent, we got you to take, to do, we got you to deny a defense, because what they do is they generally don't let you put on a defense. So you can use any adjective or superlative about me, nobody is able to spin why a judge, especially when you've got 10, let's say, Australia, Canada, England, and they're doing the same thing. Why does it cross international lines that these guys are doing that? So it's that manipulation that I can tell them, by the way, I'll get one second, by the way, you are part of an international study on judicial misconduct and you did beautifully. You did exactly as we predicted you were going to do. You're not the one in control, so why don't you dial it down a bit? Yes? How are you making these court appearances on behalf of clients when you're not an attorney? How are you getting away with that? Well, generally because if you're not an attorney, you're a more likable guy. Oh, come on! <laughs> uh, okay, that's a, uh, he's asking how I can make uh, these personal appearances for people when I'm not an attorney. Uh, the key thing I did as a plaintiff, I did the habeas corpus as a plaintiff. They eventually struck me, but that's how I got my foot in the door. When you hear me doing it with the IRS, I have to get the third party authorization from the client, and, and then the IRS speaks to me. Uh, you don't have to be an attorney in the tax court. Yeah, that's what I thought. But what about the traffic court stuff? Uh, the traffic court, I don't go. 
I, I, people do that on their own, and when I did it with Norm, it was on the phone. We were both on the phone. If you hear a lot of the other hearings, I, they, like the, the uh, Maryland one was a uh, Maryland Comptroller's Office, that was the state tax, so it wasn't federal. And so like in California, you don't have to be an attorney. You just do the power of attorney. And, okay. Uh, was that it? Okay. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here at Libertopia 2011, and if you have any other questions or comments, we're back there. And uh, we do the show, I'll be doing the show the last hour live, so tune in. Thank you.